Barbara McClintock spent her life as a pioneer in the development of maize cytogenetics. She studied chromosome interaction and behavior through the life of the cell. In this, she theorized and discovered several genetic principles that today we accept as founding principles in genetics, including crossing over, centromeres, and most notably, transposons. She was able to link phenotypic traits to chromosome features using only a microscope. It has been said McClintock was so far ahead of her time, it took the scientific community almost 20 years to catch up with her. Her brilliance did not always pay to her advantage because her ideas were so far advanced and because she was a female in the male-dominated sciences, her ideas were often met with resistance, even ridicule, and this made it nearly impossible for her to advance her career. In the 1950s, she stopped publishing altogether out of fear of ostracizing her colleagues. She continued to work on transposable elements and maize cytogenetics until in the 1960s when corroborating research started to be published. She famously wrote a letter to the American Nationalist pointing out the similarities of this research and her research in the 1940s. It was only after this she was recognized for her discoveries so early on. In 1983, she became the first woman to win an unshared Nobel Prize in philosophy and medicine. Credit where credit's due, she was awarded the prize for the discovery of the transposable element. There's certainly a lot more story to tell, but this video's purpose is to demonstrate that throughout her life, her research built on itself and continues to be a bedrock for geneticists still today. In her early work, McClintock's research focused on developing ways to visualize maize chromosomes. Through carmine staining, maize genetics was born, and she was able to characterize the morphology of the 10 maize chromosomes. In 1929, she published a short article Chromosome Morphology in Zia Maze Characterizing Linkage Groups in Triploid Maze. This paper was said to have been the spark that fired the scientific interest in maize, cytogenetics, and genetics, which today is one of the most important and highly studied plants in the world. In 1930, McClintock was the first person to describe the cross-shaped interaction of non-homologous chromosomes during meiosis. This was between chromosome 8 and 9. Chromosome 9 is going to become very familiar to you during this video. It is central to many of the early cytogenetic discoveries. This is because some varieties of maize have a distinct knob on the end of its short arm. While looking through a microscope, this makes it quite distinguishable. It allowed Barbara to follow it through subsequent generations and visualize its interactions with other chromosomes. Here we have a short animation showing the interaction between non-homologous chromosomes 8 and 9 as described by McClintock. Note the knob at the end of chromosome 9. A crossing over event happens between chromosomes 8 and 9. Then during mid-prophase, the sister chromatids join the party. Because of the crossover event, they form a cross-shaped formation. During diakinesis, the chromosomes form a ring-like structure. And during anaphase, these molecules can be pulled to either pole. Two possible conformations will make a viable gamete, while four others will not, as they do not contain the full representations of chromosomes 8 and 9. In 1931, McClintock worked together with Harriet Creighton, one of her colleagues at Cornell University, to publish back-to-back -back papers. These two papers show that crossing over occurs between sister chromatids as well as homologous chromosomes. She had observed some of this in previous studies. These papers provided a link between chromosomal crossover during meiosis and recombination of genetic traits. They also observed how recombination of a chromosome under a microscope can correlate with new traits. This served as the proof needed to show that genetic recombination could occur during meiosis. We are going to focus on three genes, all found on the short arm of chromosome 9. These are the first genes described by McClintock. C, colored aluron, SH, shrunken endosperm, and WX, waxy starch. 
This is a short animation showing the crossing over observed. Notice the molecule on the left is an interchanged chromosome consisting of 8 and 9 and the knob. This molecule has the dominant C gene and a recessive WX gene. The chromosome on the right is a normal knobless chromosome 9 with a recessive C and a dominant WX. When crossing over events would occur, the short arm region with the normal chromosome 9 would receive the knob. The frequency of where this crossing over event happened is how they mapped the genes on the short arm of chromosome 9. In the early 30s, X-rays were used as a mutagen. This is a fairly new concept and proved to be very useful. Chromosomes exposed to X-rays can undergo a number of mutations. Most are related to the induced double-strand breaks. Having the ability to induce mutation at a much higher rate than would naturally occur made it a great tool for early cytological studies. With the aid of extra mutation, her next significant discovery was the break fusion bridge cycle. It is a particularly interesting phenomenon. It can be very hard to visualize, and this is why we have provided animations to help keep track of what's really going on. To this point, it is a testament to what McClintock was able to understand and visualize from just looking at chromosomes and their corresponding phenotypes. Here we have a representation of chromosome 9. Note the knob. Three dominant genes are highlighted, YG, C, and WX. The black spot represents the centromere. McClintock was able to make a mutated version of chromosome 9 using x-rays. It had a translocation of the short arm carrying the highlighted genes and part of the knob. It also had an inversion of the centromere and a fragment from the long arm. During homologous association, the chromosomes are forced to do some molecular gymnastics. In this configuration, a crossover event happening around or in the region of the highlighted genes yields a dicentric chromosome. The centromeres on this molecule can cause trouble during anaphase. As the molecule gets pulled in both directions, a bridge forms between the two poles. Under this stress, breakage occurs at a random position along the bridge. After telophase, this results in two cells with different amounts of chromosome, and each chromosome having a sticky end. The cell at the bottom will be viable because the chromosome contains all the necessary pieces to act as a chromosome 9. Now suppose the initial crossing over had happened at a different location. In this animation, we take out the gymnastics for simplicity's sake, and you can see where the crossing over positions could have happened. Each possible crossover would result in a dicentric chromosome with different dominant and recessive genes. Focusing in on an interesting result, we look at a product of the break fusion bridge cycle that contains the dominant C and recessive SH and WX genes. Remember, this chromosome has a sticky end because of the breakage that occurred. Note, the recessive genes are represented with a pink spot. The chromosome replicates, but then the two ends fuse during prophase. This will cause a bridge formation again during anaphase 2. Uneven breakage of the molecule causes the cell, highlighted here, to have two dominant C genes. When crossed with a normal chromosome 9 having all recessive forms of the three highlighted genes, the phenotype resulting in variegated corn kernels. It was also observed the more dominant C is collected in the continual break fusion cycles, the darker the cells containing the C's will be. A paper published in 2018, Easterling, through the use of 3D molecular cytology, observed the break fusion bridge cycle in Humulus lupulus. Humulus lupulus is commonly known as hop. It is primarily used for the flavoring of beer. New technologies have recently been used to explore the hop genome. In 2013, hop snips were published, closely following techniques developed in corn genetics. Non-Mendelian inheritance or segregation distortion of SNPs has recently been observed in HOP. In this image from a 2017 article in the plant genome, pseudotests cross SNPs were clustered into linkage groups using spatial coordinates. The top graph shows the markers segregating in a Mendelian fashion, represented in blue and red. In the bottom graph, all the markers are shown, and the distorted markers are represented in yellow, and the yellow frame. 
This is clear evidence of segregation distortion. With further evidence, this segregation distortion was correlated with non-disomic pairing in Hopp chromosomes. In the earlier mentioned 2018 paper, Easterling found that nearly half of the cells examined displayed bridges in anaphase 1 and 2. She observed all the hallmarks of the break fusion bridge cycle, including bridges, laggards, and micronuclei. The authors state that irregularities in mid-prophase that manifest in chromosome bridges, breaks, and non-disomic assortment are major contributing factors to the segregation distortion observed in dioecious hop molecular markers as well as traits such as sex. To bring this full circle, this is a photo I found of my PI, Dr. Paul Matthews, working alongside of Barbara in a cornfield at Cold Spring Harbor. Today's research continues building on the foundations Barbara McClintock provided in the field of genetics, and maize genetics continues to be the driving force, breaking new ground for nearly all plant research. This video covers just a small portion of the discoveries, achievements, and research inspired by this scientist. Barbara once said, I never thought of stopping, and I just hated sleeping. I can't imagine having a better life. With this type of work ethic and passion, you can only imagine why I am forced to keep the scope of this video fairly narrow. I would strongly encourage anyone viewing this to go out and read more about Barbara McIntock's life, which can easily be compared to the hero's arc.